Hello friends, this is our fifth lecture on intentional fallacy. Now, last class you remember we saw there are three kinds of evidences we were discussing to find out the intentionalism of the other. First is internal and then we saw internal is external. External means the poem, the stuff that is there with us, outside, public, the grammar, the syntax, the words, then uh, all theories regarding meaning, everything you can apply and then find out. So internal means the text, the verbal icon or the poem. Well, the verbal icon means the poem. That's right. The verbal icon. The verbal icon means the poem. So the poems, the internal evidence of the poem, the poem itself. And that is external. Means it is with us. It is not hidden anywhere. Second uh, evidence we saw, second type, we saw external. External means it is internal. <laughs> that means about the, the internal life of the author. Also, the culture, the background, then the author's preferences, author's likings, dislikings, and so on. So that is external. External means external to the verbal icon. External to the text, external to the poem. That's, that's why it's called external. Then second, suppose example suppose external evidence of the wasteland. That would be his life, uh, Elias' life, Second World War, then disintegration of civilization, and uh, and more, and. Uh, uh, so the craving for uh, water, so these are the external evidence that we can see. See that? Internal evidence is the poem, the wasteland. Then, there is the third one, intermediate kind, that is character of the author and also the private or semi-private meanings attached to certain words. Character of the author and also private or semi-private meanings attached to certain words. The, as we can see, example is that of Coleridge and Kubla Khan. So Kubla Khan's vocabulary, certain type, uh, expressions, etc. There is a very strong relationship or, or as uh, Professor Lowe says, the streaming nature of association between Kubla Khan and uh, I, that you find as Kubla Khan and Bartram's Travels. Bartram's Travels. The streaming nature of association between Kubla Khan, the poem Kubla Khan and Bartram's uh, Travels. So do you find private and semi-private meanings of words because there's, uh, there is, there, you find there is an, uh, an inseparable connection or relationship between certain expressions in the poem and also certain words and expressions in Bertrand's travels. But that is no proof for any intention. So that you can say, uh, you can say about say, the effect of the poem, increases the effect of the poem, or you can say uh, some new meanings given to certain words and so on. Just nothing to do with the intention of the Poets. Understand. And then I find uh, two, two or three uh, recent examples you can find. Not I can find, but <laughs> as I always say, Tim Saddam, Beasley, they can find. And they have given us also. First one is see, the biographical evidence will not help you it anyway. That is, allusions in poems, extensive allusions in the poem. So the first example that he's taking is, take, he takes is Dunn. John Dunn's famous poem, Valediction for Good Morning. There is says, moving out there brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocence. So now you try, this is allusiveness. Now you try to find out the knowledge, dense knowledge of the celestial bodies, astronomy, 
old astronomy, new astronomy, all those things you try to find out. It is not going to take you anywhere near the intention of the poets. What you find here is, there is a tension at parting. The tension at parting says, our life is not, our love is not shallow. If our, if our love is shallow, it will be like an earthquake. The parting will be like an earthquake. Movement of the earth, moving of the earth. Or, if you, if you think that our love is, our love, our relationship is smooth, it will be like the, the moving, movement of the earth around the sun, which is a normal thing. Movement of the earth around the sun is a normal thing. So this parting is very normal. The other is, our, our relationship is not as comparing to the, the, uh, the trepidation of the spheres. Trepidation of, uh, if our love is shallow, if it is only at surface level, then parting will be very it will create commotion, emotion, and it will be very vehement, the emotionally. But if it is like the movement, if it is very deep, if it is very sincere, and it is like life, you and me, one and the same, no difference at all, means cannot be separated. If it is, if, that, if our love is like that, then that will be the parting is just like the movement of the spheres. Movement of the spheres, very the vastness and the magnitude of the movement of spheres. That nobody notices because it is so huge. Like that, our parting is of that magnitude, that vastness, it has got that vastness. Nobody will notice it. So there is no point in tear floods and stone and so on in our life. Now here, uh, the point here is, we, would, we, we need not much bother about the, or uh, the elaborate knowledge of, go after the elaborate knowledge of Dan and his knowledge of astronomy, and his knowledge of the celestial bodies, celestial bodies, his knowledge of the new theory and old theory and so on. After all, what is it? It is a complex metaphor. It is a complex metaphor just to show you that the parting between the lovers, it is, the love is so deep that it can become, it need not be expressed, no external show, like that of the preparation of the spheres. If it is a small, at a small level, then there will be external show. And that is like the earthquake. Everybody will notice what is happening and so on. So, conclusion is that our love is so deep, so parting, I, whether I am sitting near you or I am away physically, still I am very near you. So, parting is not suppression, parting is again this, you, we are, it's a union, so to say. Even parting is a union. As not noticed by anybody, because like it, the preparation of the spheres. But shallow elevation, surface level elevation. For example, if I compare, uh, sometimes you may disagree with me, but see, the commotion created by, the violence created by the parting of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Eh? Or the violence that was, uh, the, the violence that accompanied the parting of Romeo and Juliet. What happened? They committed suicide. So everybody noticed this. Like in the same way with the, the matured lovers, so you can say, uh, of um, uh, Antony and Cleopatra. Even there it is a violence involved. Violence is involved in that. But now you just look at the Troilus and Crescite. So Troilus, what happened to the Troilus, you know, at the end, when she deserted him practically, although in the story it is not clear that whether he, she deserted him or whether she was in a, a caste situation that she could not come back. 
She went with the diamond, we know that. But what happened to Proilus? No violence, no problem. She, he becomes silent, stops eating, unable to eat, and no emotions, nothing. And then the other he waste away. So that is the depth of his love and feelings towards Krishna. So deep, so vast, so great that it's unable to express even. This is my opinion. Now <laughs> you can disagree uh, with the reasons or agree with me, accept it my reason. So allusiveness is not, that's the point here. Allusiveness is not a proof for indulgence. Now another example is there. That's the famous example of yes, the Dimson. See, you can see it is as a, uh, it is for the contrast between the actual Thames and also the idolized Thames. In part three, five, seven, you know, you know it, it begins like this. The reverse tent is broken. Last fingers of leaf clutch and sing into the wet bank. The wind closes the brown land on her. The nymphs are the past. The river bears no empty bottles, sanded papers, etc., etc. And then comes Spencer. Sweet Thames runs softly till I end my song. Now, suppose you study uh, based on this, these lines. This is elusive. These lines are elusive. That's the contrast also. Now, you try to find out the intention of the author writing this. What is the clue? There is no clue at all. Now, was, he, uh, was, he, was he making a historical study of the times then and times now? What is his intention? Etc. We have no idea. But as a firm addition, one of the critics of uh, uh, critics of TSN says, Alien solutions work because of suggestive power. Suggestive power, that is the point. By the movement of the lines itself, even without Spencer, the help of Spencer, that effect could be created by Spencer. It's nothing to do with biography, nothing to do with uh, any uh, intention of the poets. Intention means genetic fallacy or International uh, fallacy is confusion between the poet and its origin. So the poem and its origin. Some say it is a psychological streaming. No. It's a totally different thing. The poem is a different thing. Or suppose you equate Hamlet with the Shakespeare. How can you do that? Can you say that Hamlet? Is to be or not to be, etc. These are the or his emotions, the emotions of the emotions of Shakespeare. Then what will you think about the first stuff? And then what will you say about the other law and so on? No. Yeah, verse of great verse of art, created by an author who is an who is a great genius. The word for all times. That's all. Understand? So you cannot find out by probing into the all that you go after Shakespeare. Shakespeare married an elderly woman. She ran away from there and they went to uh, the land in, in, in Stratford of Panavan, then went to uh, the London and then she became a stable kid. What, what relevance of these things are? Creating such, uh, such a uh, semi tragic and semi comic characters like a Shylock. It's no, no such thing. So, probing or studying all the 
going after illusions of a poet will not take you anywhere near the intention of the poet. Listen to that. Intention of this work of art. Work of art is a totally different thing. It's public and uh, the critic, for the, for the critic, it is a public property. That's what we should understand. Or he says, he again gives examples of done. See, go and catch the falling star. That's the song. So the done says, what does he say? Uh, he says, teach me to sing, teach me to sing mermaids singing. Teach me to sing mermaids singing. And then even parallel, something almost like that in love song of J. Alfred Prefer. So at the end of February, I have heard mermaids singing each to each. Now you go and search after this. Why did Dan do what, what is there any relationship between or any correspondence between go catch a fall, go and catch a falling star and the love song of the alpha before. You are not going to find out. Uh, you may find that there is there are allusions similar for example, but that is not going to tell you anything about the intention of the poet or the uh, intention at the time of creating this work of art that is writing it, that is the poem itself. Can't find it. So argument, not my argument, <laughs> that is the, these two great critics, they argue that allusiveness, going after allusiveness, going after the uh, knowledge. So for example, in, this, in the case of Dunn, or uh, in the case of Shakespeare, or in the case of, say, even Marvel, is it? not even Marvel, see, Marvel to his co-mistress. Let us know, and he says, no, I'm sorry, this coin, uh, the, the rolling the, of coin mistress, let us roll all our strength and all. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into a board. Marvel. Then, the love song of the Alpha of same Yamas, I say. To have, to have squeezed the universe into a ball. To have squeezed the universe into a ball. Sad and then full of irony. To have squeezed this universe into a ball. Before that, he has already said about indecision, about I am not Hamlet, Prince Hamlet, all those things. And now he says, to have squeezed the world into a to have squeezed the universe into a ball. So there is a small image. Same thing I have just now told you about Marvel. Or in sweetness up into a ball. Marvel's lines are so energetic, so passionate, but the other one is sad and ironic. They like come by and study, come by and come past and all those things. I am not going to find, you may find similarities like this, but you are not going to find the intention according to these two great critics. So my dear friends, it is to judge a poem on the basis of its origin or what we call the genesis, that its origin, or the confusion between the origin of the poem, the poem and its origin, to sum up that is intentional fallacy. So intentional fallacy means the error that a critic makes in judging a poem based on the origin of the poem, the mind of the artist. And then finally, uh, they sum up this like, like this, they say, to know the meaning of a poem, you need not consult an oracle. See, 
to find out the meaning of the poem, you need not consult an oracle. That means, where is the meaning of the poem? The text. New criticism. Close reading. My ear is Close reading. Understand? So, thus we come to the end of the the intentional fallacy. The arguments the arguments against intentional fallacy. So, the conclusion is that biography, culture, history, politics, religious background, knowledge of the author, his knowledge of science or philosophy or any such thing, none of these things will help you to make the true or the right critical assessment and bring out the meaning of the poem. Because the meaning of the poem is there in the poem, in the text. So make close reading, the verbal icon. The text of the poem is the verbal icon. So close reading and then the other things, you know, all the other paraphernalia connected with judging a poem. This will only mislead you. It will not bring out, help you to bring out the correct meaning, the right meaning of the poem. Now, what is the fate of this theory that we will see later? Or if you want, if you are so anxious about it, I will tell you now, right now, by 1970s, as it happened in new criticism, after 1970s, it simply was eclipsed by such great grand theories like postmodernism, deconstruction, feminism. What happened to new criticism happened to this also. But I would say that there is some a sense in this argument. If you go after the, in, in the Indian verse, especially the romantic critics, you can see. Romantic critics and romantic poets. So they were, in, in a way, they were, uh, they committed some errors, probably we can say. When you come, when you think of the argument, or uh, when you consider the argument put forward by these two critics. Now, whether after 1970s this has become, this is, uh, this has almost become uh, something that is not, we can say, unimportant in the academic world. It is an intellectual exercise for us, for students of literature, you and me, and uh, it's uh, nice to go through the arguments because it will sharpen your critical ability. Yes. So, with this, we can go to this part, and next we will start with the affective fallacies. Not affectionate fallacy, but the affective fallacy. What is affective fallacy? And then, that in one way, in one, what you can say like this, you can sum up like this. Intentional fallacy is the confusion between the poem and its origin. Then, Affective fallacy is the confusion between the poem and its result. Is it catharsis, as Aristotle says? Is it transport, as Lodinus says? Is it, uh, does, it uh, does it corrupt, as uh, Plato says? So these are the things we are going to find out in the next uh, session, that is affective fallacy. Till then, bye. Have a nice time. I hope that you are you are you are getting some benefit out of my lectures. In that case, you should share this. If you like it, you should share this. You should also subscribe to my channel and ask your friends and classmates to do the same. All right, that will be very nice thing now. Uh, our friendship for our friendship and our relationship to continue like this it will be it will, well, uh, it will be a great uh, uh, help so just, okay fine thank you I'll see you again